Welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining me on Spotlight on HR today. Now, full disclosure, this is my first panel Spotlight, so I am super excited to collaborate with such an esteemed panel of TA and HR leaders. So to introduce the panel to everyone, we have Ewan from Aegon, Carolyn from AG Bar, Tasha from Spectrum Impulse and Gordon from Ernst & Young. So trust me, I've pulled in the big guns, guys. These leaders know their stuff, so we absolutely need to listen. Um, now, just to provide some context uh, before we begin, this all came about, and it was quite good timing, actually. I'd read an article by Corn Ferry um, that had said 37% of CEOs and senior leaders that they surveyed envis envisaged uh, a future where humans are going to collaborate with as opposed to compete against AI. And this, this got me thinking. And as I say, it was good timing because I had noticed a lot of content recently in platforms like LinkedIn, for example, but also having conversations with my own network um, around talent acquisition, but with particular reference to the use of tech and AI. So I thought, right, I want to pull together a panel of people, and I should say, full disclosure, and I'm right in saying this, guys, none of you, you may be aware of each other, but you've not spoken to each other before. You don't, you know, you've not kind of crossed paths in terms of your careers, have you? Nope. 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 So I thought, right, I'm going to pull together the, the, these people because it's all about knowledge sharing. It's about discussing. It's about challenging status quo. So the other thing I did, and you all know this, I decided as well to reach out to my network and actually say to them, look, this is what I'm doing. This is a panel. This is a topic. What do you want me to ask them? And I have had a phenomenal response. Now, I cannot ask every single question that came in. However, what I've done is I've really tried to categorize them into themes so that we can cover hopefully as much as we can. So, so let's crack on. Welcome everybody. And let me kick off by kind of asking the first question for everyone really, but what, what emerging trends are you seeing in the recruitment and hiring process, particularly when it comes to technology and automation? And if I can maybe just kind of ask you that question first, Ewan, and then we'll kind of go along the, the panel. Yeah, we're happy to have to go first and be put on the spot. So <laughs> I think... Uh, and again, be much harder for, for everybody on the call who comes after. I don't want to steal too many, but there, there's lots of discussion about AI and the use of, of AI. Uh, from what I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of discussion on it. But again, at the same side, I'm, it's slower on the adoption uh, side of things. I, For me, when it comes to AI as well, such a broad spectrum, mm. which can be used yeah. in so many ways. And I guess for me, I've been trying to kind of reframe my thinking on that topic because what I saw a lot of, KT mentioned on, on LinkedIn and discussion, I saw a lot of negativity about AI and it's going to take yeah. our, our jobs away. But to your point a moment ago, how do we work well with it and get the balance and get these blended models, which are absolutely paramount? But uh, you've seen a lot of, of negativity in the AI piece uh, about you know candidates maybe getting their CV done you know, using chat GPT. I reframe that thinking and think, well, is that not a real level or is that not quite a nice thing? What if somebody's incredibly dyslexic? What if somebody's neurodivergent and maybe needs that assistance? Well, that tool is actually yeah. really helpful. So there's a lot of uh, emergence on the a AI piece. I think talent acquisition, I think we're getting more savvy when it comes to digital roadmaps and, and really yeah. being quite intentional with things like ETS optimization, understanding wider digital estate. Uh, and then I, I think great intervention in terms of assessment and how do we engage candidates that bleeds into experience etc but I'll, I'll stop there and pass to some of the uh, other panel yeah. panelists because no, I could go on all day as you know some good points listen there'll probably be some common themes here given given yeah. the subject matters that you all specialize in and um, so Caroline I mean in terms of if I asked you the same question what are your thoughts um so yeah you covered most of it so oh, thank sorry, you for that. Right. no no it's, it's really good and, and all really valid um we are seeing the same at AG Bar I guess um it's just finding the space to really consider what the options are is, is probably where we're at. We're seeing a lot of um, options coming through from companies. So ATS add-ons, AI screening tools, um, you know, interview for video interviews, um, recording the notes that, that there's an option to do that and, and linking into the DEI strategy. So we're seeing lots of offers from companies. Yep. 
okay. through tech, but I guess it's just trying to, to work that through and have the time to, to yeah. build it into a roadmap, yeah. as you know, says. And what about you, Tasha? Is there anything you'd like to add to any of the, the comments that either you and or Carolyn have made in that? Um, I think that there is definitely a balance in terms of the usability of AI, especially from kind of a neuroinclusivity position that when we are trying to get our words out, we can get stuck. Yeah. And it will utilize the way to create a flow of conversation mm -hmm. or even bring a way to bullet point points that you're trying to get across that ultimately the nerves and the anxiety mm -hmm. may take over. And it gives you that access and support to streamline that and yeah. not feel as though you're kind of brain vomiting and getting ahead of yourself. Yeah. Um, on the other side of that is that, you know, it, it's not that it can't be trusted, it's just that it shouldn't be fully trusted that all of the information that you're getting is correct. And that whilst, yes, I think it's great to use it as a system of support, make sure you're doing your fact checking afterwards mm -hmm. and that yeah, what you're putting point. forward is factual information. Big. Anything you want to add, Gordon, on that? Yeah, I think firstly, thank you for the, the really generous introduction. My mum will be delighted and very proud when she hears how you describe me there to lead into, right? So, so thank you for that. I, th I think, yeah, I would lead on lead, lead on to the points. I think, you know, what what, what people have said is, is accurate. I think the only observations I would make at the moment is I think the talent industry is a little bit confused at the moment around where AI is going. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it, we're kind of at the point where we know it's it's coming and it's it's mm -hmm. here, but but where do we adopt it and how do we adopt it and how does that complement yeah. the candidate experience first and foremost, right? Because people predominantly, you know, still we hear it's, they want to deal with people from from yeah. what I hear in, in, in my mm -hmm. um, industry. So so trying to get a situation where AI can complement the process and not take over the process for me is the utopia that we're trying to get to. And I don't feel at the moment in the industry we're quite there yet. Um, yeah. And that's probably the biggest challenge for me is trying to understand how we can use AI to complement the process instead of taking over the process. Yeah, no, I like I like that a lot. And some really valid points there. And, you know, this this leads me on to, I guess, my, my first question. And listen, the way I'm going to do this, uh, just so the audience knows, is I'm going to come to each of you with a question. Um, but by all means, if anybody wants to sort of chip in and, and say their experience or their thoughts, feel free. Um, but I'm going to come, first of all, to you, Ewan, um, a lot of the uh, interest that I got in terms of you know audience participation in this in this panel was around, I guess, just best practice strategies. Um, so you can use Aegon as an example if you want, but just from your experience as a TA leader, you know what do you say some of the key strategies or best practices um, are that organisations can use to make sure they stay ahead of recruitment trends and make sure that they are the, the most competitive to secure that top talent because at the end of the day as hiring managers that's what organizations want they want to get the best so how do we do that how do we make sure we're on top of everybody else yeah it's a great question and, and following on from gordon's point which i think is, is such an astute one in terms of we can get quite confused quite easily and then carolyn you know you touched on the fact that there's so many bolt-ons there's so much out there i think when we talk about trends and strategies i think we need to be quite disciplined and not just picking up the next shiny thing yeah. we need to be quite disciplined and intentional with actually what is our strategy and then that that uh, real discipline and intention to make sure that it is blended so actually what yeah. problem we're trying to solve so that consideration piece I don't think we can consider uh, bolting on really, you know, innovative employer brand work or AI or any additional tech unless you've got the basics really, right? So the basics need to be down. The strong foundations can be then built on. Um, again, as TA professionals, I think we need to operate within our parameters. We're talking about tech here. Tech has its restraints. You know, Tasha talked about that. There is, there's good and bad, right? And we need to operate within those uh, constraints and be really okay with that and get the most out of the tech that is there before we add to that digital estate and make it even more confused than it sometimes might already be. So I think understanding where you are in that journey, um, what is the problem you're trying to, to, to solve and being very pragmatic. Um, I think, yeah. Katie, linkage back for me to like, what is the people strategy? What are we trying to uh, solve as a, as a function, as a wider business? Um, and get really the, the balance right between aspiration and audacious goals and, and, and living within reality and those constraints. Yeah. Um, a big thing for me in terms of mindset is just controlling what you can control. So there's a lot out there. Get really focused on what you can control and make sure there's real value add. But fundamentally, I think if we get these basics down, uh, and for me, some of that is just really good candidate experience. And what do we mean by that? Being clear on that. 
And yeah. I think when you get the basics down, you can scale up, you can be agile, it can be then sustainable. But without the strong foundations, your proposition is, is null and void and you can't bolt on everything else unless you get the basics done right. So I think for me, there's lots of trends out there. But to remain competitive, I think you do the basics incredibly well and bolt on what's required to solve your particular TA problem. I'm seeing lots of nods here. So I think there's a lot of stuff there that you're that you're saying that's resonating. I mean, just to open it up to the rest of the panel, is there anything else you would want to add into what Ewan's already said very well, I hasten to add? It's, you know, there's a lot there that I think, yeah, bang on, Ewan, what you're saying. Uh, I think that in terms of what Ewan was saying is that the issue that we're having is that there are so many variables that if you're not taking the time to build that foundation, yeah. those variables can just get out of control and it will become detrimental rather than being a positive experience for the candidates that you're trying to attract um, and obviously the recruitment process that you, you're trying to streamline. Totally. Funnily enough, that, that leads me on quite nicely, uh, Asha, to a question I wanted to direct for you. Um, because I had a lot of questions around this this aspect and it was around, um, I guess, what companies are doing to make their practices more inclusive for specifically neurodiverse candidates, um, apart from the usual, which everybody should be doing anyway, about you know asking for a declaration of any disabilities, are there any reasonable adjustments we can make? So, you know, from your observations of, of talent processes and recruitment processes, whatever you want to call them, what are companies doing to make them more inclusive? Yeah, I think um, that it's a huge subject at the moment for talent acquisition in, in the recruitment yeah. space. Um, and purely the biggest positive that we're seeing is organisations that are open to education. And that starts with language, understanding the difference between neurodiversity and neurodivergence, understanding that, you know, each individual, their personal profile traits are as unique to them as their fingerprints. Not one neurodivergent person has the same profile traits as somebody else. And I think that, you know, that feels massive to organizations when they're trying to navigate that. Mm -hmm. But what we are trying to foster is open communication. And yeah. the way that we can put that in place is you're seeing companies that are doing the guaranteed interview scheme. Yeah. And what we'll find is that a lot of neurodivergent um, individuals don't actually class themselves with a disability. And that closes that off to support and being open to have reasonable adjustments. So it's looking at that process and saying, okay, we know that some neurodivergent candidates don't consider them dis disabled or have a disability need, but is there a capability question that we need to be covering in terms of, okay, you don't class yourself with a disability. However, can we support you in a capability yeah. barrier? Yeah. And, you know, there's lots of things that we can do in terms of signposting to access to work. Um, you know, there's options for ADHD coaches, there are, you know, support systems for going over your CV, doing role play. Um, and I think it's just making sure that your processes are clear in terms of your inclusivity statement um, and not being afraid to ask those questions um, and having transparent communication that means that neurodivergent candidate are not afraid to approach you because we have very curious minds. And if you're open for discussion, we'll have it. We'll be there. And mm -hmm. we will help you build a process that may be more inclusive for neurodivergent candidates. Great. Anything anybody wants to add on that? Yeah, Katie, if, if I don't mind, I'd love to pick Tasha's brain a little bit more on that, um, Tasha, because it's something, you know, certainly I'm really curious about. And I love the point you make about not just about asking disability, but capability. A really hot topic that I've heard a lot recently companies are doing is sending interview questions in advance. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Because I've, I've seen different people that are neurodivergent or, or neurodiverse have a different takes on that. I'd love yeah. to get your view on what you feel about that, if that's okay. I think that as we discussed with the, the different um, profile traits, it's not so much as having a blanket approach other than having options. So you can have a 
application option system. And it doesn't need to be complicated. It could be things like you have an application form, don't have it death by PowerPoint, 10 pages long. You can ask if you need assistance. You know, lots of people think that neurodivergency is purely autism, ADHD. No, it's dyslexia, it's dyspraxia. <clears throat> So therefore, having something in bigger print, having someone to support you to talk you through the application, doing interview applications where you talk someone through that or sending questions on a simpler basis, um, I think are really positive. And if someone asks to be able to have the option for the interview questions, have that on your application. Do you need interview questions prior to your interview? It's just opening up these conversations to find out what works best for neurodivergent candidates. Great, I love that actually. That's a really good, a really good point, Tasha. And thanks for that question, Gordon. Um, hey, can I just come in on the and, yeah, and this is I'll, I'll, this is just a statement and we can move on pretty quick, right? Yeah. I, I wonder about <clears throat> interviews more holistically, and I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, and I really don't. But when you unpack what an interview is, it's quite false right in terms of its setup so would you ever go to a meeting for two hours with three people that you've never met before without an agenda so i think we should do yeah, more in I'll terms like. of giving people questions and and yeah. setting people up to succeed I, I, would, would i accept a meeting for two hours with three people not blind date. probably yeah. not exactly <laughs> that not a blind date, that's a whole right? other trend <laughs> so that, there's a whole other, that's an episode in itself right but i think i, I think businesses i think the, the world of work talent i think we should strive to do more yeah. yeah. Regardless, just to set people up to succeed, an interview is a false state. It's very mm. unsettling. Yeah. Um, let's just let's just take some of the stigma out of that and just yeah. let people go and have yeah. really informed conversations that are two way. Yes, yeah. they need to be scored. It needs to be evidential. I understand all that, but it has to be two way because we as an organisation won't be right for some people either, and that's yeah. okay. So and just that's okay. Uh, exactly. balance it's and transparency. Okay. I think yeah. are paramount. Okay. Um. Right. Carolyn, I'm coming to you next because um, this is something that, uh, and again, I don't know, it's just timing and the universe listening to me, but um, one of my colleagues, Kelsey, had put a post out, I think it was last week on LinkedIn, and it was around, it was actually around COVID and people coming out of COVID and having gaps in their CVs where they've had to, through no fault of their own, come out of work. And, and this kind of linked in with one of, or not one, several questions that I received about this panel. And it was around the fact about, from an applicant perspective, they're going through TA processes that will either involve, as we've just spoken about, you know, Tasha, Gordon, uh, you know, the panel, around applicant tracking systems, they have to upload CVs. Um, what, you know, or how can organisations who ensure that their applicant tracking systems and screening processes are inclusive of candidates who might have had non-traditional career paths or, or gaps in their CVs. And the key question that was coming through to me was, should or do talent act, do people like yourself, do hiring managers want to see every single gap listed on that application form or process? Or, and do they want to know why there was a gap and why they only did a short-term contract? Does that make a difference? What What's going to, going back to what you and said, how do you set them up for success? Because it's it's a real worry in, in terms of the applicant pool at the moment. Yeah, and I hear that. And I think this is one of the areas where TA can really add value. Um, I think that um, we've got a real responsibility to do better, much to Ewan's point a second ago about interviews um, and have people spend hours and hours on a CV and list every gap just isn't yeah realistic or reasonable um, and I think that human touch that that, that human value add is, is is really important here um, and working with our hiring community and in, in that strategic trusted partner space mm -hmm. is, is is where where we need to get to um, I think it can be tempting to forget how busy our hiring managers are and maybe you know, I know. when you're working with them I think they've got time issues, busy manager space. So how can we really guide and kind of um, enable them to have a, a thoughtful appro approach when they're screening CVs? So 
Yeah. Absolutely not. I don't expect candidates to, to list every gap. Yeah. We, we want them to tell a story and have a space and a platform to tell their story. Um, but really working with the hiring community to identify those skills that they're, they're really looking for, that skills-based hiring, having yeah. a debate and a dialogue yeah. about gaps and how actually diversity of experience is really important. Mm -hmm. um, linking back to our squiggly careers approach at AG Bar, where we're encouraging folk to do different things and try different things and playing that back in, in terms of what's the reality out in the candidate pool and yeah. what we're facing at the moment um, works for us. So I do think we've got a part to play in moving moving that along and, and, and thinking of other ways that we can we can um, t help candidates tell that story. Right. No, because I think that's... There was a lot of people asking me, you know, should we only really put the career experience that is relevant to the job that we're applying for but then their worry is but then I've got like a six month gap and so what you've just said I hope will uh, yeah. like squiggly career map you know it, it's it is that that they're talking that's what they're talking about you know does the life experience that I've had and the reasons for that absolutely it's my application okay yeah. any other points anybody wants to add to that or to what Carolyn's already said I um would love to flip that on its head in terms of we're talking about gaps but what you're also finding with the neurodivergent community is there's a lot of job hopping. And yeah. you'll find that that instantly switches organisations off. And I think a lot of the work that we're doing for um, ND candidates is encouraging them that if they do feel as though they, you know, there's a history book of many, many different positions mm -hmm. and for whatever reason it hasn't worked out, you don't need to have a black book of your positions and your roles break it down put it into a skills matrix put yeah. it in why it would apply to this position and um, there's various reasons especially if you don't realize that you're neurodivergent why positions haven't worked for you and you've moved on and yeah. um, and i think that it's getting that balance between knowing you've got the skills and you've applied them and you've been in very many different sectors um, and applying that to the position that you are ultimately applying for, you know, to yeah. your strengths. Yeah. It's interesting, Tasha, you saying that because I'm not disagreeing with you. However, I am definitely hearing more of an appetite from hiring managers who I think are better educated now. Um, because my argument for people that have had a lot of careers is actually the life experience. They can come in doesn't phase them. They don't get involved in all the office politics. There's a huge amount of benefits sometimes to individuals that have done a number of contracts. And you do get people that just, that's what they love doing. They are professional contractors. Um, and I definitely, I totally agree in that, goodness me, not that I will obviously name and shame publicly, but we have worked with a number of customers who have said, oh, Katie, they've, they've moved about far too many times. That's, we, want a, we want a loyal person with at least two to three years between each job. I'm hearing less of that now. I will be very upfront. Um, however, it still exists. So let's yeah. not uh, deny that. But it's interesting because I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head, Tasha. There's, um, there are reasons. And as you say, a lot of people who are neurodivergent or neurodiverse don't realise that they are. So they don't know why that job didn't work out. You know, so it's it's a really valid point. And goodness me, you could you could ask a lot about this area, but I, I, like, I like that. Okay. Um, right, Gordon, you're not escaping. I've come, I'm coming to you now. Um, I hope your mum's got this in record. Um, right, let's go back to video interviews, right? It was something yeah. I spoke about right at the start. Now, you tell me, I'm not sure whether um, Ernst & Young do use video tech. I, I think when we first actually spoke, I had seen a, a couple of posts about, oh, we use video tech for our shortlisting. It's really innovative. My thoughts, it's not innovative. However... I know it's got its place and there are a lot of companies that use it. So I'm coming to you to ask you, you know, from your experience, how do video interviews compare to the more traditional, I guess, in-person, face-to-face interviews when it comes to actually assessing candidate qualifications as well as fit? And let's be honest, that kind of cultural fit is, is as important, if not more sometimes, than the, the actual technical skills. But what kind of lessons have you learned from from experiencing using both what what are your thoughts on that yeah i think there's two parts to it right a lot of companies now are using more video submissions which, which is a, yeah. a separate conversation yeah. we came on to but the video yeah. interviews themselves the, the positives of video interviews are they're convenient 
right? Um, the downside of negative uh, of video interviews are they're convenient, right? That that's the same thing. Um, you know, if you're looking at the the COVID situation and people not coming in, that's that's where video interviews really came to the fore, and a lot of companies stuck with that because of the convenience of you know having to just dial a candidate in, and you can sometimes move quicker with that as well, right? People don't need mm-hmm. the same time off work, call in the old dentist appointment and, and all those tricks, right? They can they can just dial in from that. The flip side of that though is you don't really get that feel, and um, from a candidate perspective as well, right? That's important. I mean, in advance of this session, I was reflecting on. My experience at UI when I joined, I remember going into the reception and being really nervous and, and speaking to the receptionist who said, have you got an interview? And we chatted for a few minutes and she said to me, well, look, you look the part and you seem quite pleasant. So as long as you know your stuff, you'll be OK. Uh-huh. And I thought to myself, I, I kind of do know my stuff without being arrogant, right? This is my, this is the area I've been working for a long time. Um, and it put me at ease, but also gave me a really good first impression of the company. That was my experience yeah. getting in and, and, you know, yeah. meeting the receptionist, seeing the building, seeing the interviewers. Um, so I went in, you know, in a, a different frame of mind and possibly if I'd just finished a work meeting and at that finished at one minute to one and dialed into an interview at one o'clock, right, when you're in a totally different mindset. Um, yeah. People are also very different on camera, you know, myself included. Uh, I can be quite animated in person when I'm speaking, but on camera, I've had feedback, I can be quite still, just based on your sitting posture and your all yeah. these different things. So you're not really necessarily getting a real gauge of who the candidate is. You, you don't have that opportunity for the small talk in between, which sometimes can be really important, right, before and after yeah. um, the session. It's, it's really clinical. Um so I think what we're seeing more of certainly at EY is, uh, you know, we, we're definitely where possible switching back to face-to-face. And mm-hmm. I caveat that slightly, we do a lot of overseas recruitment where video yeah. interviewing, going back to that point, is really convenient because you're not going to fly everyone into the UK, which sometimes we had to do in the past. Um, so it's really convenient to do video interviews with those that are not in country um, and you can still assess their capabilities in that way. But where people are local um, and can, we, we have now gone back to you know that preferential option of, of face-to-face just because yeah. you can build that connection relationship. Like I say, importantly for the candidate as well as as well as well the company, um, it's a two-way street ultimately. So yeah, we, we're finding that the, the benefits of face-to-face interviewing outweigh the, the sort of convenience of the, yeah. the video approach. Okay. Karen, I mean, what, what are your, what's your take on it? So agree with all of that. We we've got a bit of a blended approach, as I suppose yeah. most people have. Um, at AG Bar, my own experience, I had a recorded interview, a face to face video interview, and then an into person interview. So there was a yeah. three stage progress, and that yeah. opens up another question, doesn't it? A bit length the process. Yeah. However, it did give them a really rounded view. Um. So so I think a, a blended approach, depending on location, grade, seniority, all of that yeah. that, that stuff is, is is where we're at at the moment. Okay. And I'm just I'm going to open this up just because I know it's such a key a key question. But um, you and what are, what are your sort of approaches at Aegon around this area? Yeah, it was, it was interesting when Gordon mentioned it about getting into reception. Uh, it took me back to when I worked at the Commonwealth Games, and we had hundreds and thousands of candidates coming in, volunteers, you name it. Uh, and a colleague at the time who worked on reception said a statement with me, and I, I use this example a lot. And it stuck with me for all these years. And she said, I'm not the receptionist. I'm the director of first impressions for this organisation. And I love love it. I absolutely (laughs) love it. So one minute, for example, we would have a candidate coming into Gordon's point, really nervous, I'm coming for an interview. And then we would have someone from the Commonwealth Games Federation, or we had Anthony Joshua, and she would treat them all the same. And I love that. And it sticks with me. It was was quite nice. Gordon also made a really interesting point about COVID. And you really seen a sharp rise in video the use of video i guess yeah. like this as a as a, a yeah. way but you also saw a really sharp rise in using it as, as this sort of screening tool so called record does one way video and i guess i look at that and reframe my thinking on that and think at the time where human beings needed the most connection ever we were forced to stay at home and not connect mm. he is potentially talent acquisition wider talent we drove that even further to less humanization and, yeah. and more disconnection. Yeah. So I think what we've discussed, and it's clear that there is a place for some of this yeah. at certain times if used in the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would love to see, and Gordon touched on there, Carolyn as well, of you know, coming back out of the pandemic, well, certain things worked pretty well before then. Let's progress our thinking. So I guess at, at Aegon, we have a pretty blended model similar to Carolyn if there's times where yeah. um, seniority, different levels, absolutely. Um, where we can try and bring people into the office because our office is great and you're going to be there. So we're 
we're two days a week in the office. Yeah, okay, and it's, it's so really important that you know your brand as well. Sorry to speak over you. No, not at all, and I agree with your point. So, like, yeah, yeah and then we get a real sense of what, 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 what the workplace is like, what it feels like to work here. I remember at AG Bar, I got a factory tour, and I was so giddy. Yeah. It was so exciting, but it really did kind of solidify the reality of working in a manufacturing and fast-moving consumer goods company. So yeah. I think that buy-in and that unique selling point is quite important for a, a, fact, a visit as well. Totally, yes, I, totally agree. And Tasha, I think also just a final yeah. point. Sorry, Katie, if I just made oh, a final oh, point on that. I think, that, Yeah, just, just, I think we also have to remember that when candidates are interviewing, it's unlikely they're interviewing in one place, right? So, so the small wins are really important. So if you've got a candidate, just to Carolyn's point, they can come in and see the building and see the environment and meet the people versus someone who's just had a video interview. I don't mean to say just it to demean it, but, you know, the, the, it's a big decision to change yeah. jobs, right, and move into a new place. So if you've got three options and one you've got and met the people and you love it, yeah. um, and the others you haven't had that, you might think the company's fine, the job's fine, but you've had the feeling, right? You've seen it, you know what you're getting into. Um, so so that competition element and those small margins are really important as well when you're trying to compete for the best talent in the market. Yeah. Absolutely. Tasha, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think um, in terms of, you know, bringing us back to covid it opened the ability for talent acquisition on a wider scope. So I do a lot of predominantly independent financial advisor firms recruitment. Mm -hmm. And the neuro kind of to bring that back inclusivity, the traditional nine to five everyday commute, it, it, it can very increasingly result in burnout mm -hmm. and we're finding that the remote aspect of being able to do video interviews and having that entry it, it's given a wider scope to the neurodivergent community I mean 20 percent they, they estimate 20 percent of society is neurodivergent so yeah. if you're closing off with only having face-to-face -face interviews you know, you're closing yourself off to 20% of society, but it also means that you're tapping into a wider, you know, direction of talent that you may live in Scotland, but the employer is in London. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that, you know, you, you don't stand a chance, which I think is very positive. Yeah. Um, but then there is that aspect of human interaction being able to go and touch and feel and see where you're going and, and get that feel for the vibe and the culture and mm -hmm. um, again very very strong argument for the positives and negatives on both sides yeah i think you know the key thing i'm hearing from all of you there is that whole kind of blended approach and there's a balance and making sure it's fit for purpose etc um so listen let, let me uh, kind of move on to yourself ewan um with this theme in mind, you know, there is increasing use of AI in recruitment. Mm -hmm. um, and this literally ties in with everything we've just been saying, but you know, how can companies strike a balance between efficiency and ensuring that that kind of human judgment and empathy are still part of the selection process, especially for, to touch on Tasha's point and all of our points actually, but especially for those neurodiverse and neurodivergent candidates. Yeah, it's a great question, and you've got this whole spotlight on this one topic. You know, but for me, it's, what, what do you value more? It's speed or service, right? So there's there's yeah. there's, there's trade-offs uh, from a talent acquisition perspective. I would almost rather strike that balance and offer exceptional experience that perhaps breached a KPI, a time to offer KPI, so if people felt really valued throughout that. Yeah. So I appreciate the questions of uh, um, kind of aligned to AI and uh, neurodiverse. Uh, talent, my, my answer, we've talked a lot about that, will be slightly maybe broader than that as well. I think we touched on this, Tasha mentioned it earlier on as well, but for me, it starts with education and your hiring culture. So I think I, I've had some discussions recently around this, um, out with uh, Egon, just in a, another cohort uh, of, of kind of TA uh, leaders. And there was a, a piece in there of, well, actually, if you're giving people more time, then it's not fair on everybody else. Well, actually, no, you're, you're making it fair throughout your yeah. understanding and leaning in and being curious to Tasha's point earlier is, is so well made of there is such a plethora and it's a fingerprint so everybody's needs are different and this is the part where technology is never going to solve that so I think that's the part where TA can offer this elevated yeah. service and actually understand so I, 
talk a lot about candidate service, like customer service. How do we solve that problem? So we've talked a lot about the, the balance. Actually, human beings and tech both flawed. We absolutely are. We have bias and the tech doesn't pick up on. So we can't deploy one or the other. So I beg back to your point, Katie, it needs to be blended. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just understanding the pros and cons of each and when to deploy them, but being yeah. really mindful of what the cons are and not yeah. just seeing it as some sort of technology solution that is utopia and yes. it will help because it might actually be an, a hindrance to either candidates or, or process. So I think the, the balance is right. And I think the, the other part, I think we've discussed this as well, is, is never assume Again, back every candidate is different. Every piece of tech um, will solve maybe one problem and create another. So it's all, walking into things with your eyes open. Um, and I think what I've, I would love to at some point do, any any organisation that launches a product would do a focus group. You know, you're launching a new car, you do a focus group and you would speak to consumers. Yeah. Can acquisition, why, why do we not do this for candidates? I'd love to just get candidates in a room and say, this yeah. is our end to end journey, thoughts. And we, yeah. as talent acquisition specialists, think that's great into it. Look at that's fantastic. Prospective blindness. We think it's good. Yeah. People moving through that. And again, at Aegon, we, we're lucky that we've got uh, exceptional uh, talent throughout the business in terms of like UI, UX, customer journey. So we're, we're tapping into some of that knowledge to bring that into the world of TA. Amazing. Anybody get any points to add to that from their own perspectives or experience? No, I think, you know, it's, as you say, you and good grief, we could we could talk about it all day, but some really good valid insights there. Um, okay, Tash, I want to come to you next. Um, and I, I think I touched on it right at the start, but and actually going in with what Ewan's just said about, you know, we don't do con- sort of consumer groups and focus groups. This is this is the candidate voice here that I'm about to ask because see the amount it actually almost I thought, good grief, this is actually worse than what I thought it was. The amount of people that reach out to myself, my team, who are utterly overwhelmed at the moment in navigating, trying to find themselves a job. And, you know, they find it really difficult. And the the reason I wanted to come to you specifically, Tasha, is you've got such amazing insights and experience in this area. But I really wanted to ask you, what would your advice be to these applicants? Because they are feeling almost as if they are rejected before they even applied to a process right so how what what kind of tips can you give them to maybe help them overcome those feelings and um, you know are there for example contacts out there are there systems that they can tap into are there processes that could help them navigate what is an extremely competitive market especially when they know that they're competing against neurotypical applicants so is there anything you can share that will help them to feel that that less of that overwhelm and more set up for success i would love to be able to have a magic wand that i could wave to take yeah. that aspect away but unfortunately as part of the makeup of neurodivergency the imposter syndrome that is felt um can over really be overcome with organizations becoming more and more educated on inclusivity and but of course there's tips you know that that neurodivergent candidates can try and and come over and and sit down and and it takes a lot of courage um to be able to sit down and understand what your barriers are and then turn them into a positive experience and i think part of that is understanding that it's a two-way process. You may be going for an interview with this company, but you're interviewing this company. This is, you know, 50% of your life. Don't feel as though they hold all of the power. It's got to suit your needs. It's got to match your requirements in terms of where you see yourself. So I would definitely say having a clear understanding of your needs um, and understanding what your employment criteria is. What do you want from this position? What, yeah. what do you see? Um, and, and sitting down and taking the time and having this bullet pointed and having a mantra as such. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that not being afraid to reach out 
Um, we're very curious people. We want to know why this is happening. What's the reasoning behind this? And and you don't know what you don't know. So don't be afraid to reach out and approach companies if there's something you're not sure about or there's something on the the you know job advert that doesn't quite make sense. Go and speak to somebody. Ultimately, organizations should be open to this. If they're looking to build the culture that suits you, there should be an open door policy. Yeah. Um, celebrate your differences. You know, there, there's things that we all bring to a situation. It doesn't all have to be wrong or right. It's not all or nothing. Um, definitely utilize recruitment consultants. Um, there's a lot of this storytelling that we are talking about that yeah. imposter syndrome with job jumping and you feeling as though you know you don't look loyal because you've yeah. had so many no go and speak to a recruitment consultant they will go through this for you there are services that will support you you know look into access to work there's the british dyslexia association adhd foundation dyspraxia foundation yeah. um and ambitious about autism all have support systems in place to get neurodivergent candidates into the workplace. Yeah. And it's it's becoming more and more prevalent that neurodivergent candidates are the right people. They just don't know how to get over their own barriers. Yeah. Keep asking questions. Keep going back. Keep believing in your skills. If yeah. you're not sure how to put it forward, go and speak to somebody and they will sit yeah. down and support you. Brilliant, really, really good advice. Um, Tasha, thank you for that. Um, Carolyn, um, another big theme that came out of the, the, the network that came back to me was around EVP culture. So I wanted to ask you know, you this question. How, how does AG Bar, for example, how do you incorporate employer branding and cul company culture into your talent acquisition strategy that helps you attract and retain that top talent? This is another big question, isn't it? This is another spotlight I session. I know, I know. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's my life at the moment. We are launching or working on an employer brand um, to launch uh, before the end of the year. So I think if we consider consumer brand um, as being what our consumers think of our product, then we can think that employer brand is, is building that reputation and telling the story about what life would be like to work here. Yeah. So actually, it's quite a heavy commitment. You know, it's all, it's, it's, as Tasha's just said, 50% or more of your life spent at a company. So I think it's the silver thread that runs through everything that we do in tea and, pro and beyond, um, you know, right across the company. So I think it really has to be authentic um, and it really has to help build the foundations. It's, it's got to paint the picture that, that, that people feel at every part of that, that process. So in terms of TA and how we build in the strategy, I think um, a really authentic attraction strategy that shows up where our, our de talent demand is and where our candidates are yep. um, and has some really... Um, you know, provocative thought leadership about what that good looks like and considering everything we spoke about today, really um, helping our hiring community and challenging their thinking on that yeah. um, is, is really key for me. Having a really solid candidate experience. It's not rocket science, is it? We really need to look after candidates and that feedback you get about not hearing anything from a company and you know, they're consumers of our brand. They drink Iron Brew, I'm sure, or Rubicon. And we, we really need to, to make sure that that candidate experience is, is, is really solid. Um, that everybody that they meet or come across is living and breathing, breathing, sorry, the, the employer brand, the EVP is able to confidently talk about it. I think that's that's really important. And then right through to onboarding and induction that their experience matches up. And it's constantly um, kind of reviewed and, and feedback loop is, is important. So mm. I, th I think it's really key for, for talent acquisition to, to consider what that reputation is to, to make sure that the talent is seeing us and, and, and hearing us and, and wants to come in and join, join our company. OK. And did anybody, I mean, listen, you're right, Caroline, it could be a whole spotlight in itself. But you and Gordon, Tasha, anything you want to add to, to complement what, what Caroline's already said? Yeah, Thank you for yeah. my, my side. I just uh, yeah. sorry, you're on. You go. No, on. You go. 
I was going to say, I love what you said, Carolyn, about the, the consistency throughout, right? You know, from, from offer state, or sorry, from application stage all the way through to onboarding and, and joining up. Um, that's so crucial. I don't, don't think people, you know, realise just how important that is. So, so I love that point. I think that, that's really key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, exactly that. What Gordon said, I would just echo some of that. I think for me, I've said for a number of years now, I think employee engagement can start with a job advert, right? I think in talent acquisition, we set the tone. Yeah. And if we set the tone poorly, I think it impacts your engagement scores. So yeah. it, it, this is why, for me, in terms of that pride of delivery and the importance that talent acquisition puts on these, some might say really basic things like a job advert, an interview script, a LinkedIn update, that sets the tone. Yeah. Uh, and it needs to be maintained right the way through. So I think, uh, yeah, I would just build on uh, Carolyn and Gordon's points. Totally agree. Okay. And Gordon, I'm going to, I'm, I'm conscious that, of time but I want to ask you one last question before we kind of wrap up um how how would you say you measure success uh, and effectiveness of your talent acquisition strategies in terms of you know delivering for the organization in terms of its its capabilities how would you measure that yeah, it's a really difficult one, actually, because I'm, I'm not going to pretend that we get it right all the time, right? It's a, it's a never-ending cycle, and I see people's faces in the call at the moment, you know, as if maybe they would do that same journey. So that, that's the quest, right? That, that's what we're all looking yeah. for to try, and, to try and get to. There's a number of things we have done, and it links in a little bit to Carolyn's point. We introduced a candidate engagement team specifically for that a couple of years ago that, that could create that first impression you're talking about, right? To right, okay. almost educate us on how we can go about doing that, creating talent tools for those individuals and keeping them warm so that when roles come up, we can we can bring them into process and, and then onboard them the right way where we try to, to measure that I can give you a really practical example of one thing we've, we've done that, that's worked quite well is we, we had an observation that I mentioned earlier we recruit quite a lot from overseas for some of our roles um, yep. we did an observation with some really talented people but when we looked at performance outcomes at the end of the year individuals we recruited from overseas were, were probably no, more heavily weighted towards the bottom end of the scoring than, than possibly the top end um, mm -hmm. and we were looking at why that was and I think we probably misunderstood or, or you know underestimated just how big a jump it is to adapt mm -hmm. to the new environment so as much as we felt we'd quite an important and, and you know valid and, and strong onboarding system it probably didn't translate right all the way through the organization so we introduced a my first year program um, which was designed for us to manage them from that candidate engagement journey all the way through we would then gradually hand them over to a buddy um, in the organization who instead of just getting them settled for the first week would be responsible for them for the first year um, to try and transition that journey and TA were involved in that program yeah. throughout right those conversations those meetings quarterly reviews half year reviews end of year reviews and we made massive progress in turning those individuals around right so um I think I think that's the important thing is that when we talk about retaining or, or measuring the strategy, there has to be an integrated approach with the business. Yeah. It can't just be that recruitment and TA do their bit and they're in the business and there you go. You have to get that that real time feedback as you go. And we've now introduced focus groups, for example, at various points mm -hmm. in the process when people are in the business. That also helps with getting referrals, um, which selfishly helps us. Absolutely. Um, but it but allows us to, it allows us to get feedback on what's worked well, but also maybe what's fell through the cracks a little mm -hmm. bit when people are in. Has the job been misrepresented in any way? Has the support not been what you expected it to be? As, as a team short staff, which is meant you're doing more than you should, were you sent out to a job before you even got a house, all these kind of things, um, mm -hmm. that allows us to then have a really ongoing relationship with the business and feed that back. Because getting back to Ian's point earlier about perspective blindness, the business, you are still delivering the people. And it's like, well, you've delivered as good people, they can do the job. We have to give them that perspective of actually there's a lot more to it than that. People take time, they need support, they need you to support them. And it can't just be clinical in terms of they're now in and, and they're capable and ready to go. So yeah, the measuring part, I'd love to say we've got a silver bullet for it, but we've We've tried to do as much, and, and the, the key part we've found is having an integrated approach to the business is the best way for us to understand whether the cause of the problem is and then try and work with them to solve it. Brilliant, brilliant. Listen, I cannot thank you all enough. Uh, Jen, I'm going to be fully upfront. I was a bit nervous. I thought, oh gosh, how am I going to manage all these people? And But you have been fantastic, brilliant, uh, excellent insights. And I, I know this is going to be really popular. I want to kind of wrap the session up just with a kind of final question and I'm going to come to each of you and I'm going to ask you for I guess your takeaway so I want you to think about your audience and I want you to think about if it's an applicant or indeed a hiring manager what would be your top takeaway that you would want to give them to ensure that their sort of talent acquisition strategy or indeed in case of the if it's a candidate how they can ensure that they're going to be successful when they set out to find their next role and if I can come to you first Dasha. Yeah, I think that my kind of 
biggest takeaway from this is that you don't know what you don't know. And if you're looking to be neuroinclusive, there are, um, you know, a number of amazing organizations that can come in and, and give you the training. Um, I work closely with a, a company um, called Welcome Brain Consulting, mm -hmm. and they, they provide a certificate um, following an audit for inclusivity that you can then proudly put onto your website, let candidates know that you are neuroinclusive. But I think ultimately the responsibility for getting it right lands on the organization mm. and you need to stress, stress, stress test your processes. You know, go through the application yourself, do a role play, yeah. see where the gaps are, see what the barriers are. You know, if you're not testing your own systems, how do you know where the gaps are? So I think it's do the prep, yeah. look into the analysis, go through the process and stress test it. Um, and if you're not sure, approach companies that can take you through it. Amazing. Um, Carolyn, what would your takeaway be? I think for me, it would be partnership, working in partnership with your stakeholders, your TA team, your, your candidates, um, and building really strong foundations. We've, we've, we've been in TA recruitment for a long time. We've been doing this for years, um, but getting the basics right really it, it always comes back to that, doesn't it? It does. It does. Ewan? Uh, I think for me, what I've, I've heard a lot of great discussion today, but I think my big takeaway, my big urge uh, for people would be just mindset. I think with a, a mindset yeah. that's curious, that's inquisitive uh, and agile, you can overcome any bit of technology or any process that's not quite there. Get that mindset right, be really uh, curious. And the thing for me, and I know everybody pr probably tried to get away with tickets last week, I've heard this quote a lot from Noel, <laughs> right? You'll never forget how you make people feel. Right? Oh, I know, the totally. Best, best totally. ATS in the world, the best AI in the world. I will never... <laughs> replace when you said I'm going to phone you before the end of the week Katie and I pick up the phone and phone you yeah. do the basics really well and get the mindset sorted and you'll be grand love that and Gordon last but not least what would your takeaway be yeah similar to what you said it's, mine would be it's a two-way street right you know a lot of organizations and recruitment functions think about what they need from the candidates and assessing candidates and forget that candidates are assessing them as well mm -hmm. that process has to be really candidate friendly and going back to what Tasha said there's more onus now on getting to know candidates individually um, and what, what works best for them um, hiring managers can often put pressure on us to do things a certain way recruitment functions are the experts they've got the experience they speak to yeah. people they know the nuances of it all um, so, so be strong in your beliefs and, and you know yeah. what you know and pushing back where you need to because it is a two-way street and it's never been more so than what we see at the moment. Totally. Well, listen, um, as per, I will be tagging you all in the, the video which goes out and I am fully expecting you to get messages from the audience just with some more questions and, and you know, the insights. I, I guess I'm, one of the kind of, there's a couple of really key takeaways that I've taken from listening to you all. I loved what you said, Tasha, about the offering options because you're right I think sometimes I mean I'm always arguing I'm always arguing with stakeholders going, I don't think you should do that that's not a great idea that'll put these types of people off or etc but it's the options bit that's that was what the missing link definitely I think if you can give people options if they don't want to take it that's fine that's okay it's not going to go against them um, mm -hmm. but equally it's about collaboration and trust and actually see the key thing going back to what you were saying you and I love um that phrase as well. They'll never people never forget how you make how you make them feel, and particularly for talent acquisition, you want every applicant to go away feeling positive about their experience, whether they got the role or they didn't. Yeah. And for me, that is around that feeling. It's about did, did did I feel valued going through this process? Did I feel included? Did I feel equal to the people that I've met with, spoken with? So there's, there's so much in this spotlight that I think people will take some real assurance from and just some really good, valuable insights. And it's just great to get the four of you together and be able to actually have you all in a room to be able to offer your, your insight and your experience. So thank you again. And as I said, I think you should be prepared for getting messages and kind of comments put up to sort of pick your brains even further. But thank you again so much. No Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having us.